This podcast is made possible by Radial Engineering, creators of audio solutions for recording studios and live stages from direct boxes to unique switchers and reamp devices. For more information, visit www.radialeng.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Oh. Senor Rabinos could just as easily be on a bill with Flying Lotus and the Boredoms as she could with Erica Badu and Esperanza Spalding. Her unique genre mixing of soul, punk, jazz, pop, and Latin music groups planted her firmly in a musical space all her own. Following Senya's first two albums, 2013's Magic Tricks, and the wide success of 2016's Black Terry Cat, and the extensive touring and hustle to promote it, she visited a curandero who diagnosed her with a loss of spirit. Though uninspired and unmotivated to make music, she was encouraged by her longtime collaborator and co-producer, Marco Buccelli, to put the work in and continue to work. Rubinos's new release, Una Rosa, is her own novella. It is a rediscovery of her musical self that explores new sonic territory, leaning heavily on the use of synths and drum machines to frame her stories, reflections, and expressions. Jeff Stanfield chatted with Senya from her home in Brooklyn. Enjoy. Well, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. I'm really excited to uh, to chat with you. I've wanted to do so for quite a while, so this is this is really fun. I I have been a, a listening to your records since they first came out so what but that's is, crazy really i think black terry cat was the first one that uh, i got turned on to and then went backwards i just thought it was one of the weirdest blends of styles and you know proficiency yet with a punk rock aesthetic that i thought was so cool so so this will be fun i get to ask you all the questions about this stuff <laughs> wow Thanks. That means a lot. Do Do you remember when music and your interest in music and recording was sparked? Yeah, well, I was always listening to music in my house. My dad and my mom, neither of them are musicians. Nobody is a musician in my family, but they love music. And my dad was from Cuba. My mom is from Puerto Rico. And they both really liked salsa music, like traditional folk music from Puerto Rico. My mom loved and would play. Um, my dad would play. My dad loved to dance. So we were like, we would just any excuse that he had to dance salsa, like we were dancing salsa. But my dad was also a classical music fan, like hardcore, um, would always be blasting like Carmina Burana, like at all levels and at all hours of the day, like really intense stuff in the car where I'm just like, what are we driving into? Like the apocalypse or something. <laughs> and he would like take me to the opera and to the ballet when I was really little. Um, he just loved it. Um, so it was always around me as a kid. And I quickly um, just learned that like music was a space for me, like that I could just be in on my own. And I started singing pretty early on and my musical tastes were, you know, a little less ambitious than my father would have liked them to be. He wanted me to be like an opera singer and classically trained pianist, which is what he always wanted to do. He always wanted to be a pianist. Um, but I was just really into Mariah Carey and wanted to be her. You know, I was like, <laughs> this is me. I'm Mariah Carey. I want the poster. I want the cassettes. I would just sit around like I think I was seven years old and I would just sit on weekends and just spend the entire day like learning all the lyrics to every song. And I didn't even really know what she was talking about or like what most of the words meant. But I would just like study them. And my mom got me this karaoke machine that's basically was like a two tape uh, deck uh, like cassette player where like she got me these karaoke you know uh tapes of mariah carey songs and i would like sing to these karaoke things but then i figured out that i could actually tape myself um so i started like as i got a little older around like 12 i started writing my own songs on this machine and i would just take two blank tapes and like layer voices and like my little keyboard on it and beats and i just actually found 
uh, some of these cassettes last week um, that were being like my, my childhood home is being sold and they were still like they're still playable somewhat. Sometimes they start and stop, but it's kind of wild. Like I was making beats and I didn't even know what I was really doing. I was just playing um, and I hadn't had any like formal training. My, dra- my dad tried to get me to like take piano lessons but I just wasn't into it. He tried to do with flu. I cried when I found out there were minor keys. Like I learned all the major keys and then (laughs) I thought I was done. And I was told that like, oh, if you just learn these, then you can sing. And I was like, great. Okay. And I got to the the last major key and then they were like, okay, now minor. And I was like, I cried and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, so it was, (laughs) it was disappointing. (laughs) It was very disappointing to him. And For me, it was just more play, you know, it was just like play time. And it was my time to just it was something for myself. You know, it was like my own private space. That's interesting. And and so uh, just to go back on your on on the recording part, I mean, you were were you bouncing these tapes back and forth like you'd record and then record another track and just do sound Mm -hmm. on sound back and forth. Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. So like by the end, it was really like there was a thick layer of like shh noise on top of everything (laughs) because I would just go back and forth and I didn't have I mean I didn't have anything except for this karaoke tape machine um so and I had a a keyboard that had like this built-in speakers it's like Mm. a Casio keyboard with built-in speakers that came with like some pre-programmed beats and I would just like play the beats and then I would spit on top of it or I would play like um I would get like a pencil and play the table or like a bed frame. I have a beat that's with this bed frame that I made and just, oh I would use God. the carry Oki microphone to record it. I would love um, to hear some of that stuff. That'd be ooh, amazing. It's intense. It's very intense. <laughs> it's intense to listen to, but there's one that's like me clearly trying to figure out this pop music thing. And I'm, there's some that are more experimental. There's some where I'm just like doing some kind of jazz, what I think is jazz. And then there's one that's like, I'm making a pop hit or something. And the lyrics are like, I came down here to bust the move. It's like, it's ridiculous. It's well, right, so but you embarrassing. Were, you were a kid. So, I mean, it's supposed to <laughs> I be was ridiculous. 12. Yeah. I mean, and we might need to reissue, remaster. I, yeah. Yeah. I think that would <laughs> I'll get Heba Kadri on the case and see if she could fix it. <laughs> yeah. She'll, she'll fix that right up. No problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds like your parents, so they weren't actual musicians. They were just big music fans. Were, they sounded like they were supportive. I mean, they were paying for piano lessons and had a had a plan. They weren't musicians. They were just pretty supportive of your uh, endeavor. They were, they were very supportive and patient of the space that I needed to do my thing. Uh, and my dad, I think, was paying for lessons early on because he thought... I could be a child prodigy, but then quickly realized that I was just not interested. Um, but, you know, when it came time to, like, figure out what I was going to do after high school, like, I just wanted to move to New York. I just want I, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. I just wanted to move to New York, meet other musicians and, like, learn how to do music stuff. Um, and that wasn't an option, you know, and I, I'm like first generation born in the United States, like my father escaped communism, like, you know, like left, he was a professor in La Habana and like came to the US and worked at 7-Eleven and like started all over again, you know, and and my mom from Puerto Rico is like the first person to graduate from the university and her family. And like, you know, it's like, for me, it's not, it was the no college thing was not an option. And I was like, okay, well, I guess music school, I didn't really want to go to music school, frankly. I I thought, like, this is going to be such a waste of time. Like, who cares? I was really into jazz music at that time. And I was just like, I just need to go to New York and I'm going to meet people and I'm going to learn how to do this thing. But uh, but I was like, okay, music school then. Um, And they they were pretty supportive. My dad was kind of like, you're too lazy. Like, you'll never be able to do anything because you're lazy. And also you're old. Like (laughs) he was he was really thinking about, you know, like a young you know, six-year-old violinist vibe, you know, um, and that wasn't me. But um, I, right. I think for both of my parents, it was important for me to, to to give me the opportunities they never had to just do whatever I wanted to do. Like, that was the, their dream, you know, to, like, create a, this situation that it was such a luxury for me to be like, I'm going to study music, you know, um, or get any, like, choose what I wanted to do. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And I think my mom took the approach of like, I'm not going to force you to do something else. And then like you grow up and hate me like, <laughs> you know, because like you might as well just do whatever you want. And then if it doesn't work out, whatever, it's on you. Like it's not my thing. So I read that, you know, Miles Davis was another big influence on you. And mm-hmm. again, when I listen to your records, I, I hear bits and things of what, where, you know, where I hear it the same, where the references are, you know, a tune like five reminds me of he loved him madly. So I wanted to ask you about that. Where's that coming from? I, uh, f- five is, yeah, I was like, I'm so glad you, no one ever asked me about like the, those kind of instrumental moments on Black Terry Cat and, um, like I that that piece just came out of improvisation with uh, my drummer Marco Buccelli, who's produced uh, with me a Black Terry Cat and my new record Una Rosa and Magic Tricks, and we've been we met at Berkeley and we've been working together for over a decade. So he's like my he his his work and and his sound and his aesthetic is like hugely important to what my sound is, and like he's been a witness to like my writing and like developing um you know ideas for all of these years um so that that record and that particular piece five was us just kind of jamming and improvising and um we you know a lot a lot of my writing like would just be would just come out of improvisation um for the most part you know and like we we wrote some uh we wrote uh cherry tree together from magic tricks that was like the the tune that we kind of really composed together and like came up with like this groove and this thing. Um, But a lot of the times I would be like writing on my own and then I would bring, you know, a song or an idea to the studio and be like, okay, this is what I want to do. And then we would workshop it and like produce it out from there. Um, But yeah, but five is really, uh, you know, this improvisation that was based off of a rhythm that he was playing um, basically. Um, And I was just playing Rhodes and, I just I really liked it and was like this needs to be on the record and and we just captured it um kind of live and then and played with it a bit um and Marco was really great at kind of just zeroing in on an idea and making it happen I'm more like oh okay I want it to sound like this or I want to you know I'll play him a track or something and say like oh like thinking about this kind of sound for a keyboard and then he'll make it happen you know so he's very much like my hands um in in a way and I heard a, uh, a friend of mine told me about these guys who who worked with Stevie Wonder when he was like getting into like doing more synthesis stuff um he was describing to me this process where basically you know Stevie Wonder was like coming with all the songs and coming with all the jams and playing and these guys like were kind of hooking up these synth sounds for him um, and making all all of this like this palette for him to work with. And he brought this anecdote up because he's like, that sounds like what you and Marco are doing. And that totally is like, um, is that process. But but yeah, so five really just came out of of improvisation and a jam. On Magic Tricks, can you tell me a little bit about making that record? Was that more of a homemade thing, or uh, mm-hmm. was it? Did you go into the studio with a batch of songs? Um, there's been a there's been a real progression, at, and uh, I guess Magic Tricks and Black Terry Cat are more similar than they are dissimilar. But the new record feels like a bit of a departure. Um, so mm-hmm. I want to talk about that. But let let's talk about Magic Tricks and how that record was conceived and made. Because, you know, you have your whole life leading up to a record that's your first record. Um, And I always feel like those first records are 
interesting in that way, right? They're a culmination of <laughs> everything that you've done to that point, so to speak, and and then from there you you make more records. But so to tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, Magic Trist kind of came out of a period of time where I was just really urgently trying to get trying to play my music. Um, I had moved to New York and I was kind of coming out of this more jazz composerly type of scene where I would make I would write music I would write all my parts out and then I would get people together to play it for me but I would never myself play it so I was you know and my despite going to I I graduated from college I studied jazz composition like despite doing that like my writing skills my physical writing of parts um skills were not so great um, so I had varying, um, you know, degrees of success in getting my music to sound what it, what I wanted it to sound like, getting a, a band together to play it, um, being able to rehearse them um, the way I wanted it to. And it was just like always an uphill battle to get my music played, really. Um, and even like there's a song like Los Mango Paunos, like that song has been around for was around already for like five years or something before Magic Tricks came out before it was recorded on that or Ultima and a lot of the rhythms that I was playing were really easy to me because I just I just felt them in my body and like wrote them just you know pretty naturally I wasn't like I didn't think it was complicated I didn't think it was something to like argue about where is one or like how to write this or like how to play it or what's you know like how to break it down and it that's like all of my rehearsals would always devolve into like oh but you wrote it like this but I think it's like that and so it was just a nightmare to to get to the point where I felt like the music sounded like what I had envisioned it sounding like, like people were confident, the, the, the players were confident in playing it. And then we could actually play a gig. You know, it was just like exhausting. Los mango paunos crecen como estatuas. Mango paunos crecen como estatuas. Los mango paunos crecen como estatuas. And I think I just really urgently needed to play. And I started, um, like, I, I got um, a loop station. And that was, like, the moment where it was, like, a Tune Yards moment is when Tune Yards first came out. And, like, that was, like, you know, the looping, live looping was, like, oh, my gosh. Like, Battles is, you know, looping and, like, all this thing. And I was, like, okay, maybe I can, maybe this can be a way, you know, for me to, like, make my music without other people, you know. And I also was really shy about playing you know instruments that are not my voice in public like because again I was coming out of this very like jazz centric scene where it's like do you have the chops like you don't know what you're doing like you don't have the chops to play this you can't really play you don't know how to play that so I would just would not play I would just get people who did have chops to play things you know and I kind of got over that because I had to out of necessity I was like I'm I need to play music like for my health you know so I started looping and I started playing keyboard um, and that just really accelerated everything. And I, I played a, my first ever like solo show with like live looping and keyboards. And some of the the songs that I started developing um, became magic tricks, you know, and then Los Mango Paunos and Ultima and some of the, so- the songs that I had kind of been playing with my instrumental group, um, kind of more on a composer tip, those became more songs and then all of a sudden I had all this music and I you know was sharing it with Marco who had been playing with me all those years and he's like you should make a record like you should record this um so we made it in my basement studio with um this really great engineer Jeremy Lucas yeah it was very much like live playing it was my first time ever making a record I had no idea what I was doing and we were just kids like messing around and Jeremy had some really great microphones he brought, um, had some like good gear that he got in there. And, you know, a month later we had magic tricks and I was just excited to finally be able to share my music. You know, Uh, Marco and I started our own little LLC to just put out the record. 
a year later, uh, Bada Bing Records, a small independent label in, in Brooklyn, properly released it or you know reissued it. And then in Black Terry Cat, it was the same team again. It was Jeremy um, and Marco, and it was in my basement again. Um, but then also we got to work at Sear Sound because mm. uh, Jeremy uh, got a room at Sear Sound where he mixes um, and works, and that was a whole, that brought it to a whole other level. We had just had so much more. <laughs> access to different gear and um and synths and equipment that we that I didn't have on my first record um and also we had a little bit more time and uh and I had a budget for the first time and I was working with anti records on that so it it did have a lot of the same spirit and that we Black Terry Cat I was also playing a lot it was it was a lot about playing everything I wrote the record on bass which was a new thing for me at that time it was just like picked it up out of necessity I had to record this this gig this paid gig and I the bass player couldn't like didn't show up and I was like okay I'm gonna go to guitar center buy a bass and then I'll return it you know and we'll figure out how to do this and then I ended up just keeping it um and writing a record on it and and there's I think that those two albums have a very similar aesthetic in that they're played you know like they're very much about me like you know magic tricks was me like jamming on the keyboard and jamming a lot with marco um and everything that was in that record i could play it you know um or i tried to play it as (laughs) as best as i could and the same thing goes for black terry cat You mentioned that a lot of the the way that you were writing it was not the way that people were perceiving it or playing it, or it's so syncopated and and pretty non traditional in terms of quote you know indie rock record. I mean, I think that that's what sort mm-hmm. of caught me was like, oh, it, it just struck me as something so different than what what else was going on. And you talked about that just the way that you're hearing things, and and I can only imagine that growing up with, you know, the music that your parents were playing in the house, that's just burned into your soul, right? You know, and 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 how syncopated, you know, music from Puerto Rico and Cuba is, you know, th- those grooves mm-hmm. and, and the way that the melodies float and stuff. And I, even though the music is very different aesthetically, mm-hmm. there's, there, there's so much there that's similar. Yeah, I think it's just dancing. You know, it's just like um, you just dance. Like I was trying to play this Ghanaian xylophone called the Jeel um, many years ago. A friend um, showed it to me and someone I, I met like a master who was like kind of trying to show me a pattern. And I was like kind of freaking out and was like, OK, I can't do this. And they were like, no, just dance, like just grab the mallets and just dance on it. I was like, oh, okay. Like they taught me a pattern and they were like, okay, now just don't think and just dance it. And I kind of feel that way about, you know, about the rhythms in my music. It's just, it's, I'm just dancing, you know? It's like the moment that it's like you start counting or you start to, it's just, it's not what it's about. You find good dance partners and that's your band, right? So. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But it's also, you know, it's also a challenge because whenever you make something up, it obviously makes sense to you, but you know, then when somebody else, you know, you're inviting someone else into it, it's like they're going to hear it a completely different way. Um, And I think like a good turning point was for me to realize, and I think Marco helped me realize this too, is like, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter where one is. It Like we can analyze it and we can make it this way or we can make it this other way. But there's, it's not that like how I wrote it is wrong, you know, or like, like I would always write uh, <laughs> my my charts for my songs like they would always just start on one like whatever the first note is like that's one you know and so then I would just like write the rest of them like well that's just the beginning that's how it starts you know right. um, but I didn't like there wasn't like pickups but like it just it made sense to me and I'm like no but this is 
the way that I organized it in my mind was right. very much like there are these three parts. This is one rhythm one number one, rhythm number two, and rhythm number three. And that's it. Also, I'm not a fan of counting above like four. Like, you know, <laughs> so it's like if it's going to be <laughs> like more than that, let's just count in one or count in three, like whatever. But yeah. let's just keep it simple. <laughs> craft is a beautiful thing and you know the craft and the tradition and the science of these musics is super valuable and extremely important to to preserve knowledge of how these things came to be you know analyzing them like making you know translating them um so you know i i i definitely don't want to like undercut the study of you know all different musics and traditions and i also think that i did you know garner things that like i i keep and i hold you know and i cherish However, I do think that um, kind of just the ethos around it and what it can create for a young person or really anybody, um, but especially like, you know, I don't know, you're 19 years old or you're 18 and you're trying to like kind of begin as an artist, like you're trying to like make art or make something, you know, it could like some of the dynamics in that world are very um, damaging. Right. It's not a competition. And it's not like, oh, I'm going to prove to you that I know more. Like, I just became obsessed with, I wanted to, in that environment, in that jazz environment at Berkeley, I wanted to prove myself. And I felt like I had to. And I, I wanted to be respected and just treated, like, the same as anybody else. Um, and I didn't feel that way because I was a girl, because I was a singer. I didn't, you know, I didn't come in, like, blowing chops on saxophone. Like, so I just immediately was kind of discarded as like oh she's a singer she doesn't even know like what key she's singing in and like whatever and that just it really the effects of that really took me years like years and years and years to kind of like unravel um from from that um and and just kind of not care and say you know what I don't have to prove myself to anybody it doesn't matter if I don't know how to play the bass you know it doesn't matter if I wrote this this way and this other person writes it that way. I'm, you know, I just had to kind of like reevaluate what was important to me and really was important was just making music. You know, I had to like reevaluate and say, okay, girl, like you're not here to be the best, you know, the, the most chopsy like vocalist or like you're not here to, you know, scat a solo that nobody else can do or like whatever like you know write score the most complicated score ever and like everybody reads it perfectly like it's just that wasn't the tip the tip was to grow as an artist and make music and share and grow and learn that way you know like that's it you know I mean I think that's all part of the process and probably a valid one you know for artistic growth at the end of the day you know so even if it was a painful process i feel like when people go through things like that and then have the ability uh to reflect uh it makes them stronger and more confident moving forward in what they're doing yeah and on the other hand it just made you know some of that environment also just made me discover a lot of music that i may not have i may have missed you know otherwise i just became super dorky i could tell you like what bass player played on that take on the alternate take of, you know, the side B of whatever Mingus record. I can't remember any of that stuff. Um, but I, you could tell, I mean, I was like obsessed cause I'm like, Oh, I'm going to prove to these guys that I know 
you know, and I know better than them. And like, I just, I, I was like very, you know, but because of that, I spent a lot of time like digging up records and listening and trying to remember everybody's name and learning and like checking out all this wild music and trying to write that wild music myself. And I think it opened up my ears a lot in those years, like a lot. I think that was maybe the most valuable thing that happened. And, and I got to meet Marco too, who like would become my collaborator for my life basically. So those were, those were really valuable things that happened. All right. So black Terry cat comes out. It's, you know, it's on NPR's top records list. It's gotten all sorts of accolades and, you're sort of off and running, right? I'm assuming you're touring, you're doing shows, you're doing interviews, you're, it probably eats up a pretty good chunk of your time and, and uh, the, the subsequent years. But then they show that, that time between Black Terry Cat and uh, Una Rosa, um, you know, I, I read that you consulted a, a curandero you know, and were diagnosed with a, a loss of spirit. Can you, can you tell me about that and like what, what was going on in that period for you, you know, personally and musically? Well, I was between Black Terry Cat and Una Rosa. Um, musically, I was digging into a lot of things. I had kind of, I was very tired after Black Terry Cat. I was like, I toured a lot and I was very grateful that the album was like received at least like critically, it was received very well. It, I, it opened me up to a new audience. I felt like I was like finally getting to do all these things that I'd always dreamt about and they were finally happening after so long or what felt like so long for me. And um, But then I got back and I felt really drained and I was really detached from like music making and from myself really. And it was a rough, I, I mean, the last like, two years actually pre-pandemic was like a really really rough time like it was one of the hardest periods of my life and I think just a lot of things compounded I I made Black Terry Cat like just after the death of my father I never really stopped to grieve and it was a really traumatic experience um his passing was super traumatic for me and happened really quickly and very intensely and I was kind of on my own with it. Um, and then I just threw myself into that record, which I had all planned and was so prepared. It was like the most prepared I'd ever been for anything was this record. And it's like, okay, I have, I'm on anti, I have a budget, I have the studio, I have the songs. We had demoed every song. Like I was so prepared. And then this tragedy happened. And as I was away for like a month. And when I got back, I was just a ghost. I was completely shut down. And instead of like taking a minute, and taking a beat, I just threw myself into the record and was like, okay, now I'm like three weeks late. So now we got to, you know, get into it. And I just spent months, you know, in the studio, which was, was great. Like it was, it was awesome being able to spend time making music, but you know, everything had changed. It was like, it's a very before and after experience in my life. And like, I just, I made the record. I was very proud of it. And then I went on tour and then I would just, it was just nonstop. And I think I really, um, there was a part of me that was abandoned, you know, and just like kind of left it untended to for a really long time. And what, <laughs> what happens when you do that is never a good thing. Like eventually it catches up and boils up. So that kind of that and, and other things, just kind of my studio flooded the, the basement that I made magic tricks and black Terry cat. Um, and that studio flood was like the straw that, that broke the camel's back, you know, and that kind of just like completely um just sent me into a really dark a dark moment and brought a lot of things to the surface of just like needing to take care of myself and needing to just kind of reconnect and I got to the point where I didn't even know if I was going to keep making music frankly like I knew that I had another record to make with anti um and I knew I had to do it and it was what was in front of me but I like I was kind of just really stuck frankly. Um, and I had been making music. I, I released a string of singles um, between um, Black Terry Cat and and now and I was kind of getting into a more electronic zone and released this this um, these two songs, Diosa and Bugeisha. There's like a side A and side B. And it was like me kind of making music that was more in the box and more electronic and like kind of dancey in a way and just kind of deal, like going with that. And then working with like um, also kind of performance art and character work with this um, character I made, Senya 2020. I was making a film about her and like just kind of like really 
uh, workshopping and trying to find out what was next. But I I hit a wall um, and just kind of had a breakdown. And turns out I just needed to break down. Like that just really needed to happen in order for me to to like come out the other side. I'm very grateful um, to be on the other side and like feeling well and feeling healthy um, and healing. And uh, I started making Una Rosa just totally obliterated like I was so emotionally detached I got into the studio with Marco he was so patient with me and would just like every day you know I had my I had my archive of ideas you know and beats and songs and different things that I had and he like painstakingly went through every single thing with me and we we chose you know the stuff to work on for the record and started going in and I would just I was just so detached he'd be like okay let's try like you know hop on that synth for this and I'd be like okay like, and he's like, don't you think that sounds good? I'd be like, mm, okay. Like, I just, I, I was just probably the worst, like, collaborator to be. It was like watching, you know, paint peeling or something. I was just lifeless. Um, and it was just painstaking. But every day I would just, you know, this was during the pandemic. I had this record to work on. Thank God. Like, I had something, you know, to work on. And, and I would just show up every day to the studio. And we knew we had to finish it. We knew we had to make it happen. And I was just kind of a ghost for a while, but like slowly, just by the act of doing it, I kind of came back to life, you know? And it was like, just kind of the craft of it brought me back and things started happening. Like um, I wrote, did my best, you know? And I wrote a lot of these ideas, they, they've been lingering in different forms. I've had, you know, I had like all of my like pro tool sessions that I like would write in and have different, you know, different um, degrees of production that, that I had done on my own. Um, but, uh, but the majority of this record was really written in the studio um, right on the spot, which I've never done before. Um, and I think it was that state of being detached emotionally and just like everything that I'd gone through and that I was just trying to like stay alive that like really, opened me up to new possibilities, you know, because I think I had been so controlling also with my music. I always had been like on Magic Tricks and Black Terry Cat. I was very much like, this is how it has to be. This is what the song is doing. This is like what that section is. And I was very, I, I, I would say that I was much more like specific about <laughs> what, how I wanted things to go down and what they were going to be. And then I think in in this process, I was just so open and it led me to, to making music that I probably just wouldn't have made otherwise. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, that feeling of taking your hands, the reins off and and, mm -hmm. and just doing, it's still you. That idea of being mm -hmm. detached from it and maybe even, like you said, like becoming a character uh, to find that. I mean, that's a that's a great songwriting tool, right? To be someone else and not be you. Yeah. And it feels like a totally different record. This feels way more electronic. It, it, and I also think it's interesting that you have a drummer producing the stuff who's been involved and played on the records, and yet now he's, you know, now it's machines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it was the That's first cool. time. Yeah, it was, it was the first time, and it was, like, kind of rough, where it was like, oh, man, I guess Marco's like, I guess I'm not playing drums on this. Like, I guess there's no... I mean, there is, there's maybe, like, two mo... I can't remember specifically. I, well, there's definitely one track that's, like, two, tra two tracks that, that have his drums on it, Coge Lo Suave and... Um, oh, wait, I don't know if we ended up keeping the drums on that last track. Uh what is this voice? But, um, but yeah, but mostly it was the Tempest. Um, it was Tempest beats all day long, um, every day. And it was a different vibe. You know, I could play, uh, beats on the Tempest. Marco would usually like dial in the sounds that we were looking for and just had a blast, like making these beats on there. And I think it was something, it was a culmination of thing of like music that we had both been listening to separately, um, diff, you know, like different projects that he had worked on. He had just min finished making a record um, with this band from Murcia, Spain. Um, their name is uh, Crudo Pimento. And he made this wild record with them that to me sounded like a film. It sounded like a movie. And there was a there's a lot of Tempest on that record and just like really hard beats. And I loved it so much. I was like, oh, my God, I want my record to sound like this. I want to I want to make music 
that sounds like a movie. I want to make like, you know, like I was just thinking about like, I kept ta- saying I wanted to be like 3D music and like, I don't know. I, I was just, I was really, it just really excited me um, to think more visually of the music. And like, so that it kind of removed that aspect of the physicality of playing everything myself um, and, and, and that the ideas weren't coming from me sitting playing you know, that it was coming from me, like, imagining or, like, seeing an image and thinking, oh, okay, I want to, how do I put fireworks in this track? Or, like, you know, how do I make it sound like the music, like, I'm running, someone's chasing me down the hallway or yeah, kind of these things. So it was, that was just incredibly exciting um, to me. And and I think that sound was just, like, a natural progression. Um, and it was, it was going to happen. It was something that um, I had been curious about and Black Terry Cat I was like you know digging into like sampling and like what is that you know or just just like dipping my toes a little bit or like oh maybe I could affect my voice a little bit more you know and now and now with this album I just kind of just it was you know the studio was like a playground and I got to make the record in the studio which I had never done I was always so like private and sacred space about when I write my music like it's a it's a secret like I only I can be there when I'm writing and I thought you know what girl like this could be so much more interesting and fun if you just open it up and write on the spot um and and that's what we did yeah I mean it's interesting when machines and and gear and and instruments laying around can be part of the calculation for inspiration um Mm -hmm. and there's no right or wrong right totally yeah yeah well let's talk about a couple songs on this record and then we can listen to them as well tell me a little bit about sakude uh sakude has been through a lot that that song has been through a lot i originally that was like one of the first melodies i ever wrote for the record um kind of before everything in my life kind of went to shit like it was I spent months on just that intro um and there are these two voices that are kind of harmonizing and singing this squirrely melody over a clave and I was obsessed with rumba music in this period um Los Muñequitos de Matanza is a foundational rumba group from Cuba um I was just obsessed with rumba I don't know anything about rumba I never studied it I've listened to it I tried to go to a dance class once and was a disaster um, I just ended up just like bawling at the end of class because I was just such an it was just such a spiritual uh, emotional um, experience for me being at this class. it was an Alvin Ailey dance class it was like super high level and I showed up thinking okay my bloodline is gonna get me through this and like all here come all these white women in their skirts like just totally like pushed me to the back of the class they they tore it up I had no idea how to like follow any of these (laughs) any of these dance steps um and was just the whole time was just watching the drummers play and think and and like singing and thinking how is this working I don't understand these rhythms and how they're working together and I really wanted to write a melody that sounded like it could be this rumba melody that's kind of floating in this way on this beat and I didn't understand how like kind of almost like through composed in a way that like it doesn't repeat it kind of keeps going um so I it took me forever and I finally got this melody that I loved um and it it was kind of like a foreshadowing it's like about um like negative nancy like your your debbie downer voice your inside voice kind of getting you down and you're trying to like snap out of it you know and you got to kind of let it go um and like shake shake it off um and then i came back to that track with marco and we started really going into production for the record and we and that that track was like we really worked so hard on it and made this demo that was like really like bells and whistles very shiny and it kind of was like a rumba guavanco rhythm um and it's kind of like flashy and and also kind of like straightforward you know with the hooks and verses and i wanted to get this producer to come in who was uh very uh like well versed in rumba and i wanted him to come in and kind of like pimp it out you know so we spent so long getting it ready for this producer and then it didn't work out and then the song kind of just went in the freezer for like 
many months. And when it finally came back, I, I opened it up and was like, oh my God, I hate this. I hate this. It's so overcooked. It's so overdone. It's me like trying to prove myself in this, like doing this genre thing. And I, I, I'm like, this is wrong. But we were out of time. We had to hand in the record to be mixed. Um, so we were like, okay, we're going to do this um, like on the clock session. We were pre we pretended that we were on those. I don't know if you've ever seen that fact mag on the clock thing that they do. Or it's, I think it's on, I think it's fact mag, but they have this thing where it's like they, they get a producer or a songwriter or whatever. They put them in the studio and give them like three hours or an hour to make a, something. Um, and they have to make it. So we pretended <laughs> that we were being recorded and that we had to make this track, you know, and I was like, okay, we're going to treat this as a remix. So we're going to grab this track as it is right now. And we're, we have, I was like, we have two hours to like remix this track and that's it. And it's going to be done. And they're going to, you know, broadcast it everywhere. So that's how we like tricked ourselves into making Sakude what it is. And I, we just basically took, I emptied out the track. I took a knife to it. I took all the beats out and I just left the vocals and, um, I think we pulled out the Tempest and I just, we started jamming and then I came in with this kind of like stuttering hip hop kind of backbeat, like heavy, lazy vibe we went through. And that's how um, we basically remixed Saku then and made it how it is now. Um, and it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite tracks on the record. <laughs> How about Coge Lo Suave? Coge Lo Suave. Well, there's a there's a song that Marco got to play drums on. Um, and the whole time he's like, really? Like, as we were tracking it, he was like, but are you sure? And I'm like, yes. Um, and it has, it, and I think you can feel that excitement um, of, of his drumming. But that that um, piece, like, I wrote while we were on tour, I think, on Black Terry Cat, I would sound check with that on my bass, um, on just that little bass riff, the ba -da, da 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 and kind of had this um, floating around, and I wanted it to be kind of like a cross between like some kind of jazz riff on a reggaeton beat originally was the vibe. Um, but then in the studio, yeah, we just kind of started playing with it, and that was a track where I didn't even think it was going to make it on the record because it was just, it just really went off the rails. It just went into some really weird territory and i was like should i write lyrics for this like what's the thing but it just felt very clearly distinctly what it is and i was just like let's just have fun and and go down this rabbit hole um and it just i don't know there's something very cartoony and kind of goofy about that track and irreverent um and yeah and i i love it i think it's uh it, it reminds me a lot of like uh maybe see them uh, another track from from um from black terry cat and just it reminds me of some of my earlier writing where it's just like okay section one and then section two section one again section two like a little variation section section three but it's not as concerned with like you know what's the what's the storyline what's the hook i think that or yeah what's the hook and like what's the what's the bridge what's the verse like you know it, it's kind of just more music events that are happening over time and just i just had a blast we had a blast making that song and every time we would play it back like whenever we would reopen the session we would just laugh you know it was just like we just had a ball speaks to the power and the importance of collaboration because if, if these were tracks that you were like they were on the cutting room floor and yet your partner in crime says no wait a second there's something here let's work on it explore it and sh and 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 really uh 
see where it goes. I can't imagine how many people that only work on their own and make records on their own. Maybe there's so much great stuff that we'll never see the light of day. Totally. Yeah, I'm so grateful that I got to work with Marco on this and and on on um on my other records as well and like he you know this I think that he's grown so much as a producer like he's just produced so much more music and has just been like really out there and just his skills have just grown so much that like kind of when I got in the studio with him I'm like oh my gosh I mean like what am I offering <laughs> like what am I bringing to the table <laughs> because he was just so like miles and miles and miles ahead of of where he had been and I just felt like okay I'm just I guess I'm just here like improvising with you but it was just such a such a joy to get to to work with him because literally like any idea I had I would say like okay I want it to sound like this and like 30 seconds later we're there you know like oh okay it's like this um or just how how patient he was and, and and yeah like with the ideas it's it's so you know like making stuff a lot of times it's like you're like you said you're always by yourself like you're all up in your head and um it like you're your own worst enemy a lot of times and it's it's really really joyful when you can like actually collaborate with other people on your art you know and that doesn't mean that it's what I realize is like it doesn't make it any less mine it doesn't make it any less like my message or an idea of like what I wanted to say you know it's like it's it's making it so much richer and I think like a great collaborator just is is adding to your vision you know and like taking it in an, in other places that you that you wouldn't have have gone and like just make made me grow like just that experience collaborating with Marco in this new way after so many years of working together you know we just had never made a record like this before My best was just a really important moment on the record. I was just not doing well emotionally. Like I, I was, I was really struggling um, just to get through the days, you know. And like that day when we were writing, did my best. That came out of um, a sample of actually a Wendy Carlos piece, um, who I didn't know at the time. I had no idea who Wendy Carlos was uh, until maybe two months ago when I did my first interview for this record the interviewer said oh this rec like something on this record reminded me of wendy carlos and i said i don't know who that is and i went and i looked and i ordered um some of uh her cds because i couldn't find her music online and i get the cd in the mail i put it in and it's like exactly one of the samples that i made did my best from is actually a wendy Car like a piece of wendy carlos switched on bach and I had no clue um, that that's what it was. But I, I sampled this piece of a ballet, of a Cuban ballet that I was obsessed with. And I I just gave myself a writing prompt to like write around it. And that's how like the main riff of uh, Did My Best came out. And I thought it was just going to be kind of like a freaky instrumental composition, like kind of. I don't know, electronic classical music or something. Um, and then Marco was like, hey, why don't you get on the vocoder and just sing a little bit? And that was one of those moments where I was like, OK. And, you know, previously, like old me, I would have been like, no, there's no vocal on this track. But since I was just more open and more detached in that way, I was like, all right, I guess. You know, and I'd never sung in a vocoder before. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and the next thing you know, like 30 minutes later, I had this whole story uh, of did my best. And I was just singing this melody is improvising. And we did kind of like these long takes of just me improvising. And I kind of composited together what would become um, like the, the melody and um, of, of did my best in that structure 
and just listening back to that to those vocal takes I was like goosebumps you know it was like something like it lit a fire inside of me it was and and it was very therapeutic and was very it was just a very deep moment of connection um and I, I felt like I remembered why I sing you know and it's really just because that's what I do like it's I don't know I don't know why I just do it and it feels good it feels right you know Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. <laughs>